extra thinking you could get anybody. Page was able to find a bottle of whiskey. But when things are going badly, you don't want to make them any worse. From shearing shed and ploughed paddock to the pavilions and pitches of England. That was part of the adventure and the real challenge confronting New Zealand cricket. And the first opportunity came with an invitation to tour England in 1927. 38 matches, 26 first class games, but no tests. Now the selectors were instructed to limit their choice to just those players who had at least 10 years cricket ahead of them. So consequently, an enthusiastic but inexperienced group departed for the home country. And with more cricket on the tour, raw talent began to emerge. The compact Stewie Dempster, opening partner Jack Mills, the charismatic Tom Lowry, Roger Blunt became the first New Zealander to become one of Wisden's five players of the year. The silky skills of the keeper Ken James and the mysteries of the 18-year-old leg spinner Bill Merritt, to name just a few. Now, prior to 1927, we'd had exchanges with state teams and Australia, and contact with England had been confined to just three goodwill MCC tours, intent upon demonstrating the virtues of the game to the outer reaches of the empire. The early settlers brought with them the musket, the oak tree, the Bible, and cricket gear because a lot of them were associated with the army when they came out to the Maori Wars and that, they brought Kuka gear and there was very little sport played as we know it. Um, so there was cricket played in a country environment and our first class cricket as we know it now was virtually confined to the four main cities. So you would have seen the first and the second test matches for New Zealand? I kept the scores from, you know, in my own scorebook and I lent them to Don. I, you may have, um, if I don't get them back, I've given them to him, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> he saw the first test New Zealand ever played in Christchurch. He actually travelled by boat up to Wellington as a young schoolboy and stayed with an aunt and saw Dempster and Mills win their partnership at the Basin Reserve. He sat in front of the scoreboard and scored for it in microscopic um, print which he blames today for the reason he had to wear glasses, <laughs> was Dempster and Mills. I had a cousin who uh, we came in together. He, he could only procure a lady's bike, so uh, we finally crashed it down Haywards Hill by going over a railway line somewhere up on Haywards Hill, coming downhill too fast, bent the front wheel and had to carry it back from Haywards Hill to low hat on my shoulder. Oh, no. What, this, so one of you had a lady's bike and the other had, a, had the male bike, did you? So which one did you get? I had the ladies. <laughs> you had the first Australian side to arrive here was 1877, 78. Now, whenever they took off somewhere to play England, they always came through New Zealand or the England side came through here. So, and they went out to the, the rural areas and they played combined 22s of Canterbury or something like that. Yeah. And they had men manning the gates. They also had uh, manning the... Um, the uh, refreshment stands of gin and orange. Was it popular? I mean, nothing else to go to, I suppose. There were half holidays in the centres. The mayors declared a half holiday. Um, no doubt there would have been a mayoral reception. They also made money in those days by having a smoke concert in the evening at the popular hall. What's a smoke concert? Oh, they sang, they recited, they danced, they did all sorts of things, and public paid to come and see these cricketers. So it was a re a really a reason to come together, a, a joining of the community, if you yes. like. And that's why in shearing gangs and things like that, at the end of shearing, they often celebrated by having a cricket match. So Dad was away from the family. He was a blacksmith in the country, but he, he couldn't um, really afford to come. He paid the bus fares out of that £2.10. So he got the mailman, rural mailman, who lived in Christchurch, rural delivery, to bring the money in. And he, he stayed out there in the hut. I had uh, a few coaches when I was at school. See, I was lucky enough. My first coach that I can uh, remember was a fellow called Alf Wensley. And uh, at Eden Park, uh, from Avondale Primary School, we uh, used to walk from, from, Avondale, from Avondale Primary School to Mount Albert because that's where the trams stopped in those days. And we uh, would walk there, go to Eden Park, catch the tram back to 
me from Kingsley back to Mount Albert, go into the grocers and get a penny worth of broken biscuits <laughs> and uh, wander our way home. Well, you look forward to a Saturday morning or whatever it was because you go, you got a bat in your hand or a ball in your hand. And uh, uh, that was uh, your cricket, uh, apart from your practice during the week. Key people would be Sir Arthur Sims, and who, as Arthur Sims, played for Canterbury. Um, his family were connected with meat when the um, uh, Dunedin sailed from Omaru with the first frozen meat, where this huge industry started in New Zealand, and the Sims family were involved with this. He actually brought an Australian team here in 1913-14, and it was known as Arthur Sims 11, and that had such great players as Victor Trumper, Arthur Maley, basically the whole of the Australian side. The Australian board said, no, you can't go, but Sims' money was so much to these players, they said, we're going. My people had a shop in New Orleans, I know this is, is all connected with cricket, you know, and then on the backyard we had a uh, <laughs> half a concrete yard, not quite as wide as this room, and I used to throw a golf ball uh, against the concrete wall and with a little stick about an inch wide, and my ale sizing dog used to field out in the covers, and I used to throw this ball uh, against this concrete wall, and I used to play table tennis also. This is only connected that in table tennis I used to learn to spin the ball. I could bowl wrong ones, I could bowl top spinners, uh, you know, and uh, I could apply that thing to when I batted against the concrete wall. I could bowl head off spinners and I had wrong ones and everything coming in, which all sort of, I suppose, not that I was worrying about having been, you know, uh, but they all sort of helped one another. So how did Arthur Sims get us involved with England? Because of the meat, he was based in London and he'd played for Canterbury and he then was stationed in London and he got to know people in MCC. And so an invitation came to the New Zealand Cricket Council inviting them to send a team to the home country. Go home or come from home. Absolutely, all their parents had come from home. And um, so that's what happened, 1927. They didn't have any money. Sims estimated that it would cost 10,000 pounds. So the board of New Zealand Cricket at that stage launched a limited company, New Zealand Cricket Inc. And they sought 10,000 pounds, which they thought would cover the tour, and they sold 10,000 shares at one pound a share. I had a bonus in 1932. I got a job as an office boy at the gas company, a pound a week, and um, I gave my mother 18 shillings a week, and I kept two shillings which was paid religiously into Whitcomb and Tombs, because I'd, I'd hit upon the idea that if I could buy all my books at sale price, it would be a, a very good idea. So I had a pile of books about that, all cricket books, in Neville Carters and you know, all the top writers, Country Vicar and so on. But they would be sold at a price like two and threepence or three and ninepence. You know, that, that was a good bargain. So I was paying the books off. And uh, one day, uh, Mr. A.T. Donnelly, who was a very influential figure, Arthur Donnelly, and no relation to Martin. Incidentally, he sent Martin a book and the flyleaf he wrote with sincere regrets that I can claim no relationship. <laughs> Martin showed me that book. Um, but he wanted to buy this book that he spotted in the pile. And uh, Mr. Johnson, the bookseller, said, and I'm sorry, Mr. Donnelly, but and Donnelly was a good customer, you know, they wanted to look after him. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Donnelly, but um, he said uh, those books have all been sold to a young person. And Arthur said, oh, he said, how old is he? And he said, about 17. Oh, he said, well, if he's keen on, the, he's keen on cricket, he said, uh, here's my card. Tell him to come out and see me next time you see him. Tell him to give me a ring or something and go out and see him. And I went out to Brockworth Place, which is near Nancy's Hotel. It's a uh, corner of Rickerton Avenue and Dean's Avenue. And uh, introduced myself. And uh, he said, well, he said, you can, ta you can read my library on one condition. He said, don't take more than three books at a time. <laughs> A 
the first two tours New Zealand made, 27 and 31, were both financed by going to the public, setting up a, an incorporated uh, society, and the second time they went for £12,000. And the Canterbury Cricket Association might have bought into it for £500. And Wellington might have done that, but one or two benefactors might have paid £50. What did I get for, what did I get for my pound? Well, you just got your feeling that you were helping support New Zealand cricket, and probably a lot of people did buy a share. But it is a share. Did I get, any more, did I get anything back for it? You get the good feeling, yeah. and uh, the next thing is they lost money. Sims through the, the meat baron yes. and, and contacts. Lowry, a, a completely different but a dominating personality. Lowry was larger than life in this country, really, when you look at it. Um, his grandfather was one of the first settlers in New Zealand in 1946. Lowry Bay in Wellington is named after his grandfather. Yes, he must have been a character, uh, and he had a cricket ground, of course, um, up in Hawke's Bay. I, I admired Tom because he, he, he had the, he had the, um, the courage to do what he thought was correct, and, and usually he was right. <laughs> he just towered over everybody physically as well as um, yeah, in all of the things that he was involved with. And he had a wealthy background behind him. Um, when he left Christ College, he seemed to disappear for three years. And the odd references we've got of him in this time was big game hunting. But I can remember Tom Lowry on the boat going over to England when he was captain of the New Zealand side. He had firm ideas on what he wanted from his players and what he expected from them. He enlisted in the army but transferred to the Romantic Royal Flying Corps. And I can just see Tom Lowry with a white scarf and goggles and leather helmet and all that sort of thing. His classic uh, greeting to him at one evening was, uh, or at one meeting was, uh, by the time you get back to New Zealand, some of you blokes are going to hate my guts, but you're going to be better players. Standing at uh, Colburnie Green one day talking to Stewie Dempster, who was such a success on this tour. And I was asking him about Tom Lowry, and he said, ah, oh, Tom was a character. Tom was such a character. I remember we were fielding atrociously against Middlesex at Lords in 1927. And we dropped so many catches up until this time. And one came out to me, and I was fielding in front of the taverners at the tavern at Lords, and I dropped it. And I hung my head down, and the next moment I was enveloped by great big arms with wicketkeeper's gloves, and it was Larry who'd taken a turn at keeping wickets that day in his felt hat, who lifted me up, lifted me over the bottom. He's no bloody use to me. I remember in 37, though, I was, uh, I was sitting with Tom. Tom, Larry, Tom was playing this game, and he and I were sitting on the, on the seat waiting to go in. And... Uh, Oh, Tom, uh, what the bloody hell was that? <laughs> oh, it's a bloody letter. I opened the letter. Oh, it was from the Royal Dalton, I think it was, wanting to give everybody in the team a Royal Dalton jug. Tom, oh, who the bloody hell wants a bloody jug? Put it back in his pocket. <laughs> you know, and because I heard it, gee, I didn't like to take, take that back from my mum, but never got any further. And Stewie said one other thing. He was wearing a black shearer's uh, singlet under his uh, white shirt because it was good for his back. He was a great disciplinarian but very fair about it. He was, uh, he was, and, uh, he was a, a, the kind of, of, um, of captain who would try anything. He was a great player for the you know, to win. So wealth, actually, wealth and social position seem to have played quite an important part in the foundation, in a way, if we think of Sim, now we think of, of Lowry. Who, who was the, anybody else involved? Uh, probably Arthur Donnelly, who was the chairman of the board for a long period of time. Um, you see, and they, they had an influence. You see, at this stage, the New Zealand Cricket Council to be a member of that cricket council, to be on that council, you had to live within a radius of 10 miles of the GPO in Christchurch. In 31, we were, we were feeling our way, and uh, there was a good story from 
Ian Crom told me once of, uh, I think the English authorities thought they would show these young upstarts from the colonies that, you know, how to play cricket. And they, uh, and we started off quite well, and I think they thought, and they played, they picked a very strong MCC team to play against them at Lords. Because it was in the middle of the Depression, 1931, they almost cancelled the tour because of the earthquake in Napier. Uh, the MCC went into bat and they were six down for 41 uh, before they knew where they were. And uh, shock horror all round Lords. And Ian Crom, who could bowl at a lively pace, he became a slow bowler towards the end of his career, but he could quite lively, move the ball about. He had five for 16. And Jardine, the England captain, was um, uh, had been batting, just come in, and uh, Crom bowled him a ball which he said moved in a little from outside the off stump, and Jardine went back and hit him, hit him on the instep, right in front of the middle stump, uh, right back on the stump, you see, and the uh, whole New Zealand team, well, they probably didn't in those days, probably only the wicketkeeper and bowler appealed, uh, square leg and co didn't as they do nowadays. Uh, protocol and um, and everybody went home and Joe Hardstaff senior uh, was the umpire and he said not out and at lunchtime Ian said to him very politely oh Mr Hardstaff sir he said I that LBW against Mr Jardine must have been fairly close and Joe Hardstaff's answer according to Ian Crom was I it were and again I haven't got the accent right I it were but when things are going badly, you don't want to make them any worse. <laughs> Crank bowled medium pace stuff. It, uh, later on uh, in, in uh, local cricket, he, he became what he called a master of flight and spin. <laughs> he was a great character, was Cranky. Lowry got 101 aggressively, not out, and we got to 302. And then the MCC, there was a bit of rain, and then the MCC batted and they made 132. And that was a, a magnificent win when you come to think of it, that there was all those amateurs in the side. You know, there were the 10 of the best amateurs in England, and the one professional. Then there was time for Lowry to insert the follow-on. And a miracle happened, because he opened the bowling with Matheson, who was a medium fast bowler, but he tossed the ball to Bill Merritt, who was um, now 21 years of age, or 22, bowling his leg spinners. Hearn turned to Curly Page in the slips and, and said, this fellow with the new ball, does he expect to turn it? And Merritt supplied the answer in his second over. A ball over, a ball pitched outside Hearn's off stump, which he ignored, and a second later his middle stump was leaning back. It was Bill Merritt's wrong un. The MCC were all out for 48 runs, and, for, and Bill Merritt took seven for 28. And Bill was... Uh uh, an outstanding spinner. Uh, he could tweak the ball uh, on any wicket, and uh, it was a bit hard to, to pick his wrong one. He bowled it very well. Yes. Uh, and Bill, uh, he, he, he had uh, the courage of uh, uh, thinking he could get anybody out. 48 in the space of uh, 18 overs and suddenly all hell was breaking loose at Lords. Yes, an irresistible triumph for the 1931 team against a strong MCC side. But it was only half of a package of accomplishment. The second part was the first test. This is quite an amazing game because in it, um, it was played over three days and though there were only 2.9 runs scored per over, 146 overs were bowled each day. It was a thrill to play on that ground to start with because most of us uh, had read a lot about uh, England-Australian uh, uh, matches 
test matches, and uh, so it was a thrill to step out onto the ground. <laughs> they managed to get New Zealand out for 224. So New Zealand bat first? Batted first. Right. Out for 224, right. uh, of which Peebles got five wickets and Robins three. This is before tea on the first day of a test match. You know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm playing at Lords. It was a bit hard to sort of believe that it was Lords. And a bit overwhelming in, in some respects. England go into bat and all sorts of uh, disasters before them because when stumps were drawn, they were seven for 180. And the wicket takers had mainly been merit. My father was one of the selectors for the side and they came into for a certain amount of stick before he went away because it was considered that this boy is young and he'll get hammered when they get over there, but they had faith in him and uh, I would say they were right. I would say Merritt was the best leg spinner New Zealand's produced. Not that we produced a great many. The game developed from there and Greg, uh, leg aim, Les Ames and um, Gabby Allen both got hundreds and England got a considerable lead, a lead of 230. New Zealand bat again. Eventually Dempster got 120. Roger Blunt got 96. And Curly Page ended up with 100. But there's a wonderful story about Curly Page. He was 96 not out at lunch on the third day of this game. And it so happened that Vos had bowled the last over at um, the last overs at Page. And so he was showering down. He came up. So Page and Vos entered the room at the same time. And as they came into the room, the president of MCC, plus the chairman of England selectors, was Sir Pelham Warner. Was Pelham Warner, later to become Sir Pelham Warner. Sir Pelham Warner was manager of the body line side and one of the great attacking weapons he had was Vos. But he said this publicly. So anyhow, Vos and Page sat down to have their lunch and Vos was steaming. And Page said to him, oh, it's a bit rough and you're a bit embarrassed about all this. And he said, yes, I am. And he said, well, come with me. And they ended up in the New Zealand dressing room and Page was able to find a bottle of whiskey and they had a couple of snorts. And it, uh, as the players were starting to come back to the room to go on with the game, Vos said to Page, you're a good bloke, don't worry about getting your 100. And so Curley went out to bat, 96 not out. And the first ball he got from Vos was a knee-high full toss outside the league stump. And as he said, I didn't see it. <laughs> and he the whiskey had taken effect? And so he ended up uh, out for 104. He got his 100. He nicked something through the slips. Got his 100. And so it's just an interesting thing. I, in all the years I've been associated with cricket, I have never seen a bottle of whiskey in a dressing room. Mm, you'd have to guess it was probably hidden in the deeper recesses of Tom Lowry's gear. But the pioneers of 27 had prospered. By 1931, in the second tour, we'd won more matches claimed more wickets, scored more runs and earned more tests. And this was tangible progress. And at the same time, we were gaining the stamp of approval. The English appreciated our carefree amateur style. A core group of players was emerging. Eight players had been on both tours and all these were reassuring signs. However, with the exodus of six of those eight players to county teams, the New Zealand Cricket Council decided to exclude all of them from New Zealand representation. In fact, on the next tour, they played against us. Now, don't you be tempted to miss the next episode of this developing series. Select yourself for another half hour of the Mantis and the Cricket. Tales from the Tours.